All right. Hey, everybody. Dr. Sean Talbot here. We're going to get rolling in just a minute or two. It's uh, about three minutes before the top of the hour. So let's um, let's let people start rolling in here. We're live streaming to Facebook. We're here live on Zoom. Uh, this will be posted up to YouTube uh, sometime tomorrow. Um, so let me know as we're going through here, if you have any questions, you can put them into the, if you're on Zoom, you can put them into the into the chat or you can put them into the Q&A area. Um, if you're on Facebook, you can put them into the into the comments area and either myself or a member of the R&D team will 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 get you some answers. Um, what I'll try to do is if I if I end before the top of the next hour, um, I'll try to take some of the questions live uh, through the through the chat. So uh, be sure to be sure to put those in there. In fact, let me go and open up that chat right now. Um, and and we'll get we'll get rolling here in just a few minutes. I want to make sure that everybody gets in. I want to make sure we start on time. We've got about two minutes until until that is. Um, we're going to be talking about mental fitness tonight. It's it's it, it's it's sort of that time of year where people are thinking about their diets. And so we're gonna we're gonna talk uh, we're gonna talk all through all cool stuff about nutrition um, and give you some tips that I think are going to help you help you feel better. Okay. So we got one person from Montana. I, I hope it's, well, it's probably a lot colder colder there than it is where I'm talking to you from. I'm talking to you from just, just south of uh, Boston, Massachusetts, Plymouth, uh, where we have the Amari Wellness Center. So it's a, it's it was snowing just, to, just, just when I walked in here. So um, uh, here we go. There's questions coming in. People from California, where I think you guys are getting a lot of rain. Poughkeepsie, New York. Um, we've got, uh, we've got a couple questions coming in already. So let me know where you guys are calling in from. And um, we're going to get going here in one more minute, right? Right, right when it turns top of the hour. Um, we're going to talk tonight about uh, nutrition, uh, functional nutrition, mental fitness. How can we use nutrition, what we eat to change how we feel? Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll talk for an hour tonight. Um, some of the slides that you'll see in this deck are slides that are from our mental wellness coach certification, uh, which is actually going online, uh, maybe by the end of next week. So it's going to be an online course as well as an in-person course. In that certification, it's 16 hours of, of information about mental well-being. Um, and we, we probably spend a good uh, four hours or so, half a day, talking about nutrition, talking about the standard American diet, talking about omega-3s and vitamin D and polyphenols and fiber and all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to try to give a really, really concentrated discussion of that of that tonight. So there, we just turned the top of the hour. Um, so, so we're going to get rolling tonight. So tonight, the topic is, I'm Dr. Sean Talbot. I'm the Chief Science Officer of Mari, if, 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 if you guys don't know me. Um, this is our social science hour where we, we talk for an hour or so about some aspect of science as it relates to mental well-being. So sometimes we'll talk about specific ingredients, like specific strains of probiotic bacteria and how they can help with depression or anxiety or stress or or something like that. Um, tonight, we're going to talk less about specific products necessarily, but more sort of globally about nutrients in general. Of course, I'm going to I'm going to touch on some of the Amari products <clears throat> towards the end where I'm, you know, I've maybe talked about a particular ingredient like a fiber or a flavonoid or uh, or an amino acid. And then I'm going to talk to you about how how that is is integrated into into some of the some of the Amari products. But we can broadly put all of that under this idea of the mental fitness diet. How can you use diet? How can you use what we eat? So so diet um it isn't like isn't like a diet in the traditional sense, right? So we're here talking here on January 11th, right? A lot of people are thinking about the diet that they can go on to achieve a particular thing, right? To lose fat or to gain muscle or to get in shape or whatever. My usage of the word diet is a little bit differently. So I'm trained as a nutritional biochemist. That's what my PhD is in. And when we say, when we use the word diet, it simply refers to a habitual exposure to a style of, of food intake, right? So that, that sounds very nerdy, I get it. But a diet really is just a pattern of eating. And so that, that that's, that's important because this isn't, what I'm gonna talk to you about tonight isn't something that I hope that you'll go on for four weeks and then go off of and go back to your normal way of eating. I hope that you'll adopt some of the principles Principles that I'll talk about tonight forever into the in, into infinity, uh, because I think you'll I think you'll find that there's a there's a lot of really good stuff here. So 
All right, so let's 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 get into some of these slides. Before I get into the meat of my presentation, no pun intended, ha ha ha. Uh, I want to mention these the, the these two uh, specials that the sales team has going on. So the first one only goes for another few days. Uh, it goes until the middle of this month, so the fifteenth. And what is it now? It's the eleventh. Um, you can earn um, a, as a free gift. Our, our brand new product that is launching in just a couple of weeks, the middle of the middle of next month. I, I, I think February 2nd, February 2nd, 3rd, something like that. We're launching this new product. Um, and it's a really, really cool new product. We're doing a, a test group right now. We're doing a pilot group. You may be heard some of the rumors of, of people who have been using it through the holidays. Um, I don't want to give away too much about what the product does, but it, it definitely has helped a lot of people with their appetite. It has helped a lot of people to not gain weight over the holidays. Um, and it does it through some really, really cool mechanisms that aren't widely available out in the in the marketplace. So it's very, very unique sort of an approach to getting people to keep the weight off. Okay. So I'll I'll sort of leave it there. You guys can find out more about it in the coming weeks. But you can earn it as a free gift if you if you if you follow that promotion. The other promotion that's going on right now is uh, save 20% on happy juice and triangle of health. So sort of you know in a lot of ways the 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 Amari flagship and in a lot of ways the Kiani flagship and you can save 20% on on those uh, until the end of this month. So that's the big that's the big January promotion. So what I want to talk to you about tonight and spend most of the time talking about is what we call functional nutrition. How can we use nutrition, not just to nourish ourselves, not just to provide vitamins and minerals and proteins and all the macronutrients, the carbohydrates and the fats and things like that, right? Not just nutrition for nutrition's sake, but how can we get a functional aspect out of nutrition? Meaning, how can we go above and beyond just the nutrient content of our diet and go to fu functionality? How can we use it to help us feel better? How can we help it to, how can we use the diet to help us uh, be more stress resilient? How can we use the diet to help us be more focused and more engaged and more, you know, all those things that fall under the mental wellness umbrella? And so one thing that I will, I will ask you guys is this, why am I sad? Right. This is a this is this is one of the acronyms that we use when we talk about nutritional psychology. So even though my PhD is in nutritional biochemistry, and you guys will get an earful of biochemistry tonight, where we're going to be talking about why specific foods or why specific nutrients can take you towards a sadness direction, or why other nutrients can take you towards a happiness direction. We're going to talk about the biochemistry around signaling across the gut brain axis you know how do the bacteria in your gut when we eat a food they eat the same food and so they'll take that food and they'll produce a variety of bioactive molecules some of them that will take us in a sad direction some of us that will take some of them that will take us in a happy direction and obviously what we want to do is eat more of the happiness chemicals so to speak and less of the sadness chemicals to say it so, sort of sort of very simply well one of the reasons that you might be sad Sad is because of this, even though that might look very delicious to a lot of people. And, and before I go too far, people should know that I'm not any kind of a nutrition zealot at all. Um, I, I, I like to eat that just as much as the next person, but, uh, but occasionally, right? It, it, everything in moderation. Um, but you can't, you can't base your entire diet on something like this because basing your diet on something like this, what we call the standard American diet, will actually make you sad. There's really, really good scientific research over many, many years, over huge populations that, that have shown that the more you eat like this, the more likely you are to be depressed, the more likely you are to be anxious, the more likely you are to suffer from burnout. And so with, with, with that as sort of a background, we can sort of dig in and we can look at it on a population basis and we can say, oh, the you know populations of people who eat like this generally have more mental wellness problems. We can also look at it very... Um, very uh, in a in a in a very reductionist way, and we can say, well, what is it in that diet that leads people to feel that way? And we can pin you know pin it on things like salt and sugar and emulsifiers and unhealthy fats and artificial sweeteners and and colors. And this is the big one at the bottom here: processed and ultra processed foods, right? So processed foods, ultra processed foods are going to be high in all of these kinds of constituents. And the more that you take that in, the more you're going to have your, your the more you're going to have a bad outcome. 
Um, it's all this kind of stuff. And this is probably not rocket science, right? For anybody who's listening to this right now, but there's some very strategic ways that we can take our diet in a in another direction, right? You don't need me to 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 tell you that eating, you know, pizza every day is not a good thing or eating donuts is not a good thing or eating lunchables all the time and sending off sending your kids off to school with that kind of stuff is not a good thing, right? Everybody knows that. But why is there so much of a gap between what we know and what we do, right? Sometimes we call that the behavior gap, where you know we know a certain thing, we know what's good for us, we know what we're supposed to be doing, and yet we're not doing it, right? That gap, sometimes we can close with little changes in our diet. Sometimes that gap we can close by using supplements to sort of fill that hole, to not to not to replace the, the need for us to choose healthier foods, not to say that we can just eat a bowl of potato chips and then take a supplement and it's going to wash it all away, so to speak. But if we can use a properly formulated, scientifically validated supplementation regimen to improve our energy levels and lower our stress and change our appetite signals and reduce our stress eating and those sorts of things, then we'll be more inclined to be driven away from these kinds of bad foods and more towards foods that we know that we're supposed to be eating more of more fruits and vegetables more whole grains more you know less less processed foods so I'm going to get there in a second. I just want to give you a little bit more background. So this is a really big study that was done, uh, came out in, where's the date? 2020 or 2021? It's pretty, Sarah, 2021 in the European Journal of Nutrition. Very good journal. Um, the title of the study here is looking at ultra processed food consumption and risk of obesity. Um, they looked at a huge population of people, almost 23,000 people, followed them for immediate, for, for an average time frame of five years. And as you might imagine, the conclusion is, if you eat more processed foods, you are more likely to be obese. This is where all these pro ultra processed foods were coming from. Breads. Um, so those are things like muffins and baked goods and things like that. Snacks and desserts, frozen and shelf stable, ready to eat and heat meals, uh, uh, beverages, you know, sodas a, a lot of times, breakfast cereals. Um, spread sauces and uh, other ultra processed foods like, you know, dips and, you know, things like that. So lots and lots of places where we have access to this. And one of the things that's really problematic about it right now, and I, I, I produced a documentary a number of years ago that won a lot of best picture awards and things like that called Killer at Large, where we looked into this problem. And that, gosh, when did that come out? That was probably a, oh, I don't know, twenty. 2008, something like that, long time ago. Um, and the problem was bad back then. It's even worse now. It's been getting worse and worse and worse that the environment that we find ourselves in, where we're surrounded by these kinds of foods, you know, it's it's tough, right? It's it's. I worked with an organization called Chefs Move to Schools for a while. I was an advisor, scientific advisor to that, to that organization. And what we were doing is getting chefs in local markets to go into the schools and teach the kids how to cook food because a lot of times kids don't know they don't know how to use a knife they don't know how to use a pot and pan they don't know how to cook anything unless it comes out of a box right and the chefs were shocked to see that there were so many kids that didn't eat anything unless it was you could unwrap it stick it in a microwave press the button and then take it out and eat it right that is absolutely not the kind of food that we want to do so like I said, a lot, of, a lot of people know this, but and yet we still do it. There's that, there's that behavior gap. How can we change that, right? There's lots and lots of different ways to do that. There's lots of approaches. I want to give you a really, really simple one to do. So as a, as a nutritionist, one of the things that really um, irritates me, I, I guess it irritates me, um, is when people get very dogmatic about what you should do about your diet. Um, a lot of times people hear me say, you know, I used to say there's 7 billion people in the world. And because of that, there are 7 billion perfect diets. Now there are 8 billion people in the world. And so there are 8 billion perfect diets. Um, there can be a lot of variation between what somebody is doing, right? We, you'll see, you'll see on a, you'll see on the next slide, right? Some people do vegan diets. Some people do carnivore diets. Those are exactly opposite. Some people do low fat diets. Some people do low carb diets. Those are pretty opposite. Um, there's all kinds of ways of doing this, but what they all share is the same thing at its at its center, at its kernel, which is this. They're reducing the yellow on this slide. This is a very famous slide. It's used 
lots of places across the internet, people are trying to explain what you should eat. What a lot of people miss about this, right? So people will sometimes use this slide to say, look, you should eat more plant foods. Other people would say, look, you should eat more animal foods. And what they miss is that if you go away from the processed food thing, the, the processed food, which is making up, depending on how you calculate the data, this particular data set comes from, from USDA, United States Department of Agriculture. We're eating predominant, we as a culture, we as a, we as a, as a society are eating a lot more processed food than we need to, right? 60 to 70%, depending on how you calculate it. If we could just shrink that 60 to 70% yellow part, if we could get our processed food intake down, it really doesn't matter that much if you're exchanging that processed for whole plants or for whole meats, right? Th th there's a there's a um, there's an argument to be had there, right? And I'm going to make an argument for a for sort of a balance of that approach. But that's what the that's what the secret is. The secret is to is to pick your poison basically and choose one direction or another. Whatever one resonates with you, whatever one you think you're going to stick to, whatever one sort of works for you, go away from processed foods, but go towards whole. Go towards whole something, whole anything. It can be whole plants. It can be whole grains. It can be whole animals. It can be some blend of any of those, uh, any of that wholeness. As long as you're moving away from the process, that's going to be the, the 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 sort of secret. And then when we look at things like this, and people get very, you know, almost religious about you know uh, about which one they choose, and that's great for them. Whatever whatever floats your boat. Um, it, should you fast? Maybe. Should you do macro balance, which is basically you're eating a little bit of carbs and a little bit of fats and a little bit of uh, proteins in small meals frequent throughout the day? Maybe. That's almost the opposite of fasting. Fasting is only eating sometimes and not eating anything other times. Macro balance is eating all the time, when, when, like whenever you're awake, basically. Should you, like I said before, should you do vegan or carnivore? Those are opposites. Should you do low fat or low carb? Those are opposites. Should you do any of these other sort of popular ones, high protein, paleo, keto, blah, 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 blah right? So like you, you, you get it, right? What all of these share is that they're low and processed. They're, they're higher in whole something. And that is really, really unique from a biological, biochemical process. And so myself, as a biochemist, what I'm looking at, I look at food as information. So that food that you're going to eat, you're going to chomp it up, you're going to digest it, you're going to absorb some of it, but some of it is going to go down to your microbiome and they're going to start munching on it. They're going to digest it. They're going to uh, use some of it for their fuel. Some of it they're going to convert into signaling molecules. And that is going to go out into the rest of our, our body. And that's going to determine our physical health. It's going to determine our risk for diseases later on. It's going to determine how we perform physically. And it's going to determine how we perform mentally. So that's how I look at it. I know it's not it's not romantic about you know beautiful few foods and things like that, but that's how I'm trained, and that's I always look at food as its component parts. And 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 you know going back to that slide about you know sort of reductionist pieces, is it the is it the unhealthy fats that's the problem, or is it the emulsifiers, or is it the artificial sweeteners, or 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 the answer is yes, it's all of that because it's a matrix effect that you get when you ingest that into your body. So. People have heard me talk a lot about when we're talking about the gut-brain axis, we talk about it as, as if it's a system because it is a system. Your food is a system as well. So the more we can think of it as, as a collection of signals, as a, as a sort of a biochemical dominoes game, the better off we're going to be. So you might be asking yourself, well, 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 well that's very good, but what am I going to have for lunch, right? What am I going to have for dinner right now? So where I am, it's East Coast time. So it's a little bit after seven o'clock. As soon as I get off this call, I'm going to go have dinner and I have to make a choice. And so that choice, I'm going to make a choice more on as much on this left-hand side as I can and less on this right-hand side. So this Western diet or standard American diet or processed food diet, however you want to sort of label it, you'll see that that food ends up sending signals across our entire gut-brain axis. Some of those signals we can we can uh, identify as some of the some of the baddies that I said before, emulsifiers and sugars and things like that. That'll eventually 
actually be eaten by your microbiome. And that can result in signals that are sent from your microbiome to the rest of your body. It can result in changes in your gut lining. That might be your mucus lining. It might be the actual cells and the metabolism of the cells that make up your, your, your gut lining. Um, it could lead to an inflammatory response. It could lead to an immune system response. There was a series of studies done a couple of years ago that showed that, f that, that fast food meals like this, the body treats them almost like they're an infection right? That you have an inflammatory reaction, you have an immune system reaction to the introduction of that food because your body thinks that you're under, under attack by a pathogen. So like we, we can look at it from at that level of detail. And the, and the, the end result of that is that is, it is not, the moral of this is not, you should never eat a, that kind of food ever. You should do it in moderation. And the more you do it in the context of sometimes you do that, but mostly you do this over here, the prudent diet, now you're going to get signals and, 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 and compounds that will strengthen the gut lining, that will strengthen the mucus lining, that will send, that will send um, anti-inflammatory signals and, and immune strengthening signals into the system so that now you have a stronger system. So, you know, having a, having a food like this or having a meal like this every once in a while actually isn't that bad, right? That you're, you're able to withstand it. You're able to be resilient in the face of that, of that, of that potential damage, right? So again, in the course that we do we dive into the nitty gritty of this we don't have the time to do that tonight because we're already we're already about 15 minutes in so um i do this with all my students i also teach a, a, a um i also teach a college level class about mental fitness to try to get the students to eat better and move their bodies and get their sleep and all the things that we know that they that, that can help improve mental mental fitness and mental well-being and i always use this slide because there's a lot going on on this slide similar to the slide that you just saw there's sort of a good side of it and a bad side of it. And the question that I ask the students is, if you had to make one choice for yourself, or you had to educate a friend or a family member or a classmate or something about making one dietary choice to help them feel better, to help their gut brain access work better and help their brain work better and all, all, those, all those sort of positive things, what would you do? One choice, would you add something good to your diet? Or would you take away something bad? Would you look at that standard American diet and say to somebody, okay, no more sugar for you? Um, or would you look at that standard American diet and you would say, you know, let's try having a serving of fermented foods every day this week. Or let's try having a salad three days a week instead of a hamburger. Like what would you do? Take something away? or take something unhealthy away or put something healthy in. And I want to I want to I want to just throw it out there. Put it in the chat room what you guys think. Whoever's whoever's watching on Zoom, put it in there. Whoever's watching on Facebook, put it in the comments. Add something healthy or take away something unhealthy. Where do you think you'd get your biggest bang for your buck? And I'm just going to see what they come in. Add add something. Oh, good. Oh, there's a good mix of things. Ah, maybe it's leaning towards add healthy. A couple of people have put in take away, unhealthy. Take away, take away, add healthy. Oh, it's a good, it's a good. I think that I think the take, I think the add healthies maybe have it just a little bit. Um, both. You can't say both, Bobby. No, that's cheating. You can't say both. You can't vote both ways. You can't vote yay and nay at the same time. One, one person, one vote. Okay. I think the healthies have it. That's what it is, right? There's been really good behavioral studies to show, behavioral studies and biochemical studies to show that it that 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 the secret here is add something healthy. Add something in like a probiotic or a prebiotic or a fermented food like a kombucha or a yogurt or, or kimchi or something like that. Add some beans. You know, the, I I talk all the time about black beans being the healthiest food on the entire planet for a variety of reasons. Add in some whole grains. Add in any any of the whole things that we that we've already talked about and we'll talk about a little bit more because what that's going to do is start to send first of all it's going to start growing good bacteria those good bacteria are going to use those healthy foods to send good signals into the rest of the gut brain axis so it's going to help your gut lining so it's going to help us go away from leaky gut it's going to improve our gut integrity it's going to it's going to um uh, build up our mucus lining, which is going to be good for our immune system. It's going to send an anti-inflammatory signals into the body. It, it's eventually, you know, sort of 
that dominoes game again, it's eventually going to get up to the brain and we're going to have short chain fatty acids that are going to increase neurogenesis. So not only are we going to be protecting our brains, we're going to be growing new brains and, and our brains are going to become more plastic so that they can learn things better just because of what we did in our diets. If we take away something bad, that can also be a good thing. But what do you think happens as soon as you say to somebody, okay, Joe, no more cupcakes, no more French fries, no more red meat for you. The first thing you're going to want is a hamburger. The first thing you're going to want is a dessert. The first thing you're going to want is that golden arches looks really beautiful next time you drive by it, right? So there's sort of a psychological aspect there um, where studies have shown that if you try to restrict people, even if you're restricting them uh, sort of away from bad things, that isn't very long-term. We do a little bit of this with our reboot program where we say, hey, please for three days, eat fewer of these on the red side and eat more of these on the on the green side, you know, but it, and so this goes back to this, this goes back to where the, where the cheaters were saying both, it is both, but if you could only choose one, you'll get a bigger bang for your buck by adding something and letting somebody be sort of free and, and fun with their plan versus being restrictive and, 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 um, um, you know, this is kind of a downer when you have to when you have to take something away. So I'll leave that there. I might come back to this at some point and 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 run you guys through all the different signals that are here because this is a really fun slide. So if you were to take that, what we just saw in that last slide, and translate it into a way of eating, my favorite way to do this is something called the Mediterranean diet. Uh, people have heard about the Mediterranean diet before. It's 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 very high in fruits and vegetables. It's sort of medium in protein containing foods. Um, it, it it predominates on on um, healthy fish and and seafoods and things like that. A little bit less so with with poultry and eggs and cheese and you know sort of dairy components. And at the top, there really isn't a lot of meat going on. Right? There's some. There's not zero. It's not a vegan vegan experience. But you're but you're actually having that that less often you're using meat and sweets and things like that as like where they should be like a little a little side side dish if you will um what you'll notice about this too mediterranean diet there's also a really nice foundation of being physically active and maintaining social connections and and you know that that sort of thing right the stereotypical mediterranean meal is that you know you're there with your family it takes 2 hours you know it's a very enjoyable experience and and you know it, there's the experience and then there's the food right so so that that is an important thing i don't have time to get into tonight but that's how i've also based my mental fitness diet i've also brought in some other sort of dietary uh, um, um, patterns that i'll get to when i start discussing that um but the other reason that i like the mediterranean diet is that it has been researched more than any other diet out there, right? And remember what I mean about diet, right? A, a habitual exposure to food, a, 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 a sort of pattern of eating, not something you're going to get on for, for, you know, three weeks or three months, and then you're off, and then you're back to your normal thing. It's, it's, the, way, it's the way cultures eat. So for the last eight years in a row, US News and World Report has convened uh, a panel of uh, nutrition experts to look at all the different diets that are out there, right? The DASH diet, the, the, the Ornish diet, the vegan diet, the, you know, all the different ones that are out there. And for the last eight years, uh, well, th this US News and World Report thing has been going for a couple of decades, but for the last eight years, Mediterranean diet has been number one. And the reason for that is that there is really, really good, really big really long clinical trials to show that a Mediterranean style of eating reduces heart disease, reduces stroke, reduces Alzheimer's and dementia, encourages weight loss, prevents diabetes, um, helps with inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, reduces the risk for cancer, and reduces the risk for depression and is actually not just preventative for depression, but can treat depression, right? So dietary patterns can be majorly, majorly impactful for physical health benefits and for mental health benefits. So for all those reasons, that's a pretty darn good place to start. But one of the problems is that you know, we don't want to say to people like we again, we don't want to be very dogmatic about it and say you have to eat in this particular way. And so what I've done with the mental fitness diet or the mental wellness food pyramid you can see here is gone and looked at 
not just Mediterranean diet, but what is it about the Mediterranean diet and the Blue Zones diet, which are really more about longevity, um, and the Scandinavian diet, which is about inflammation um, and the Okinawan diet and the, and the, uh, a, a, a traditional African diet and and even lately a traditional North American diet like what did Native Americans eat traditionally that allowed them to be healthy and not so healthy now because most of them are eating a standard American diet like most of uh, uh, most of uh, you know most Americans are doing so what what is similar across all those dietary patterns that we can build in to make the mental wellness diet, mental fitness diet, make that as sort of flexible as possible for people. Well, it comes back to what I already said, what I what, what I said, you know, just a few slides in. If we can go more towards whole foods, the better. The more that we eat this style of eating, the the more that we're eating less processed foods and less ultra processed foods. So you can see here that this looks a this looks somewhat like the Mediterranean diet, but also brings in pieces of all those other dietary patterns. One of them is herbs and spices. These things that you, that you can see listed off here, things like turmeric and ginger and basil and saffron, etc. These are are medicinal, hands down. The more that you can use these liberally on your food, the better. Um, and anyone who has ever seen me travel know that I travel with a lot of these kinds of things so that, you know, a lot of times when you travel, you don't have a lot of say in what you're fed, but at least you can take whatever is there and literally spice it up and make that, make that a healthier situation, right? You're not taking away the bad because sometimes the bad is all that's there. You can add a good. And, and by doing so, you cannot just make it taste better, but you can make it biologically healthier for you in your body. You'll see that there's a lot of fruits and vegetables, a lot of whole grains, a lot of beans and legumes. And then as you go up the pyramid, less and less and less, predominantly, you know, you're still eating proteins, you're still eating dairy, if that's something that's going to be part of your diet. You're still eating healthy fats, but it's getting uh, it, it's getting less and less in 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 predominance. And so up here, red meat is is it, it's part of the plan, but it's a small part of the plan. Sweets, desserts are part of the plan. Please don't take away my chocolate chip cookies. Please don't take away my ice cream. Right, I love that kind of stuff, but I love that in in little little pieces of moderation. So you guys you guys get the idea of where we're going here, right? I also have it in the book like this i show what it looks like on a plate you know and, and people sometimes get a little bit um agitated about about the percentages right the percentages here are just guidelines right it, it's not to say that you have to eat 50% fruits and vegetables or you have to eat 20% whole grains or 50% dairy and it, you might do 0% dairy and you're going to take that 15% and you're going to you're going to put it you're going to put something else there but hopefully you're going to put something that's not a microwavable meal or not a lunchables something that's not processed you're going to fill that with something else that is more whole Okay, so I have friends that are 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 trained like I am, you know, PhD in nutritional biochemistry, who basically eat vegetables and meat, and that's what they do, and that's what works for them, right? They might have a a steak, a big steak for dinner, but but on the side is a low carbohydrate salad, right? It might be greens like kale or spinach or romaine lettuce or collards or something like that. They're probably not eating bananas. They're probably not eating oranges and berries and things like that, even though there's a lot of great things in there. And I would like, I would eat that kind of stuff because that's what works for me, but they're not right. So like I said before, 8 billion people in the world, 8 billion perfect diets, but what those two ways of eating, my plate looks like this a lot of the time. Um, and sometimes that fruit and vegetable piece is taking up more like 75%. Uh, and so by the time I get to the little bit of steak or the little bit of chicken or a little bit of fish that I'm going to put on there, it really is a side dish because there's no room left on the plate for anything else. That's what works for me. You have to find out what works for you. But what they both share is a very, very low exposure to the processed stuff because of how that's going to change the signaling through your body. And one of the reasons for that is if you're eating processed food um, uh, uh, on a regular basis, what you're doing is you're getting a lot of that bad stuff that you saw before, sugar and emulsifiers and you know artificial this and that. But what you're also not getting is this, fiber. This is probably the biggest nutrient deficiency in the, in the modern world today. 
because we're eating that processed food diet, we're not getting fiber. And why is that so bad? It's not just that fiber makes you poop, right? And everybody's constipated. It does, but fiber is the most important nutrient that is that is really, really being um, neglected because it feeds our microbiome. That's what our bacteria eats. And if we don't feed it fiber and the right kinds of fiber, which I'll talk about in just a minute, um, we're starving the bacteria. We're starving our good bacteria. So you can think of this way. If you're eating a lot of processed food, you're growing inflammatory bacteria. If you're eating a lot of, of whole food, you're growing anti-inflammatory bacteria. So if we if we feed them, if we feed the bacteria the right food, we're gonna get the right biochemical state in our bodies. As a result of that, we're gonna feel good. So if you're if you're inflamed at the level of your gut, you're going to be inflamed at the level of your body and you're going to be inflamed at the level of your brain. Neuroinflammation is one of the major, major red flags leading us to depression and anxiety. And so we can use our diet to be very, very therapeutic about how, how all that works, okay? So what, how do you get more fiber in your diet? Well, the recommendations are around 30 grams a day, a little less for women, a little more for men. But most Americans only get around 15 if you're doing a sort of decent American job of it. And, and a lot of people get less than that. And the reason is because we're eating too many processed foods. We're not eating fruits and vegetables where we get where we get the fiber. So look, there's lots of ways that you can do this. This is one of the zillion media segments that I've done to really try to educate people about this fiber deficiency, you can get fiber from all kinds of places. Look at whole grains, uh, all the beans, all the brightly colored fruits and vegetables, seeds and nuts and supplements too, if you want to. But you also want to make sure that you get a diversity of fiber. It's not just about getting more fiber. It's about getting more and more and more of different types of fiber. Because think about this, you guys. So each different kind of fiber feeds a different kind of bacteria. So let me let me animate through all these little fiber tips so you guys can read them while I'm while I'm while I'm talking through each of these points. Um, what I said just a few minutes ago, if you're eating processed food, you're growing processed food bacteria, which is going to lead to inflammation, which is going to lead to depression. If you're eating more fiber, more whole foods, you're going to grow healthier bacteria, better signals, less inflammation, less depression, and more, more resilience. Um, it's not just eating one kind of fiber that's going to do that. When we look at the bacteria in our gut, we're talking about tens of thousands of different species of bacteria that are there. And you could think of them as, as all being different animals, if you will. If you were a zookeeper, for example, you wouldn't go to the monkeys one day and say, oh, the monkeys seem to be doing great on bananas. I think I'm going to feed bananas to all the other animals in the zoo. Because if the monkeys do well on bananas, then the elephants will do well on bananas, and probably the lions will do well on bananas, and the snakes, and you know all the other animals that are in there, right? No, it doesn't make that sounds ludicrous, right? It's exactly the same thing with your microbiome. You are the zookeeper for your microbiome. And so you need to say, all right, there's one category of bacteria that likes these fibers, maybe the fibers that come from berries. And there's another category of bacteria that like the fibers that come from beans. And there's another category of bacteria that likes the fiber that comes from whole grains, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why we want a diversity of whole foods not just one whole food. We want a diversity of different vegetables and fruits, not just one vegetable or one fruit, okay? And so that can help people to get up, knowing that we want a diversity, can help people get up to these higher levels of fiber, can help you slowly go from 15 grams a day to 20 grams a day, to 25 grams a day, to 30, to 35, to 40, to 50, to 60. Traditional diets, right? If we look at hunter-gatherer cultures, they're probably eating around 100, 125, maybe 150 grams of fiber every single day. And that's because their diets are a lot of them are sort of foraging diets, right? They're eating whatever they, they have access to as they're going through the jungle or the forest or wherever they are. And when we analyze the microbiome of those hunter-gatherer cultures, not only do they have a more diverse microbiome, they have a more resilient microbiome. So it's not, not necessarily to say that, we, like, that that's a perfect microbiome, but we do know that more diversity is better. More diversity is associated with more resilience from, you know, against infection. 
infections, against various kinds of stresses. So the way that we can do that is by eating a variety of high fiber foods. And so you can see some examples here of how you might do that. Um, there's another way to do it that I'll get to. Let me see my slides. It's a little bit, it's a little bit further down. So I'll save it. I'll save it for just a second, right? It's sort of a, sort of a fun way that I challenge my students to um to uh, you know try to get as many fiber fiber um, servings as they can. Um, so there's different kinds of fiber. Sometimes we'll split the fiber into soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. You can think of that split, that distinction is that soluble fibers are the kind that your microbiome likes to eat. And insoluble fiber is the kind of fiber that sort of you know gives bulk to your to your to your poop. And, and that can be good for your gut lining. So there's there's good reasons to get both of them. And even though I've done this, I've put, you know, you know, oatmeal and lentils and apples and oranges, et cetera, are on the soluble side and barley and couscous and brown rice. And these are on the on the insoluble side. Every food is going to be a mix of some soluble, some insoluble. So moral of the story, get get a little bit from both sides, right? Get a get a blend, get that, get that diversity. Another way that we'll educate people to do this is to try to eat a rainbow. So when you're choosing your fruits and vegetables, you want to get something every day from each part of the of the rainbow, each part of the color wheel. Uh, and the reason for that is that each one of these is going to have different types of fiber which is going to be good for your microbiome, but the color is indicative of the, the, of the phytonutrient that predominates in that particular food. So, you know, things that are orange have a lot of beta carotene. Things that are, that are yellow might have a lot of lycopene. Things that are green have a lot of chlorophyll. Things that are, are blue and purple have a lot of uh, um, 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 cyanidins, you know? So each one of those is a different type of phytonutrient that is going to be good in a different part of that signaling uh, system that we call the gut-brain axis. So red ones like lycopene are in different foods. So you can go through the produce section and say, okay, here's a red one, and here's a purple one, and here's a yellow one, and here's a green one. And don't forget about the white ones. Let me go back real quick, right? Sometimes we say to people, don't eat anything white because we're talking about refined flour and white bread and white rice and things like that, things that have been milled so much that the fiber is out of them. And they really, they really are constituted as a, as a, as a processed food. But there are white things like think about, think about, um, about cauliflower. Think about mushrooms, right? Those have amazing phytonutrients in them, but th those would fall more in the in the whole food category, or not not more in the whole food category. They would fall squarely in the whole food category, whereas some of those other things you would you would want to avoid. So choose choose all those different colors to get all these different phytochemicals for all the different cellular benefits that you're going to get from them. And then some of those, we actually can extract those compounds out of those fruits and vegetables and then put them into supplements. So we can put them into green powders and we can put them into fibers and we can put them into you know different different things that are going to wake up our brain or support our gut. So here's, here's, here's a couple other slides to show that, right? Most of us don't need enough red. Most of us don't need enough of the, of the blue and purple. Most of us don't need enough green or white or orange or any of those because we're just generally not eating a lot of fruits and vegetables. I'll, I'll ask you guys this too, and you can put it in the chat if you want to. What do you think is the average fruit and vegetable intake in America today, right? We tell people they should get 10 servings of fruits and vegetables every single day. What do you think the average actually is? Oh, uh, you guys are a bunch of pessimists. Look at this. Two, two, zero, Sandy, zero. You're really? Um, four, no, not even close to four. It's it's last numbers that I saw, it's 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 2.3. I don't know how you get 0.3 serving, right? But it's a you know, it's an average. Um, that means we're eating one serving of fruits and one serving of vegetables. And for most people, that that vegetable is uh is iceberg lettuce, not a lot of nutrition in there. Um, sometimes it's ketchup, right? Tomatoes as ketchup it, it can 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 sometimes be the top one. And then on the fruit side, it's usually either apples or bananas, which actually are not bad choices necessarily. Um, but we we can do a lot better, right? We want to we want to try to you know increase increase those levels as much as possible. And the reason for that, right? All of those different phytonutrients are activators. Of the of systems inside our cells called CDRs, cellular defense responses. These are 
enzyme systems inside cells that help to protect those cells from damage. So you have those CDRs in your brain cells, you have them in your muscle cells, you have them in the cells that line your gut, you have them in your bacteria cells have them too in, in your microbiome. So the more that we can get those compounds, the carotenoids and the and the flavonoids and the polyphenols and the gingerols and curcuminoids and etc., the more we can get those, the more we're going to protect all those cells. We actually packed a lot of those into this bright mind proprietary blend that is the is the really cool part of our Vita GBX so that we can we can activate all these CDRs we can activate the nerf 2 pathway so we're making our own antioxidant enzymes so that we're we're having effects on inflammatory pathways like NF kappa B and aging pathways like the sirtuin pathways and metabolism pathways and cellular cleanup pathways like the heat shock proteins that 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 that, that govern autophagy how your cells sort of clean themselves and repair themselves. And so if we're not eating those fruits and vegetables, we sure as heck want to get those phytonutrients. And this is one of the ways to do that. But like I said, uh, just a few minutes ago, you don't want to take Vita GBX and just sit back and say, bring on the pepperoni pizzas. I'm not doing fruits and vegetables anymore. You still want those fruits and vegetables, but there's ways that we can use the supplements to supplement the fact that we're not getting 10 servings of fruits and vegetables every day. Some days maybe you do, but probably not every day. And so that's where a supplement would fit in to use our biochemical understanding of what is it in those fruits and vegetables that are having their health effects and try to replicate that as much as possible. So we can, you know, we can, we can amplify our, our protective defenses. So the fun way of doing this is something that's called the 30 plant challenge. All my students have to do this in order to, to, to pass the class. Um, they have to go off of their standard college diet for, for a week. Um, and what we ask them to do is do the 30 plant challenge, which is to get 30 different plants in your diet in your body within a seven day time period. And it, it, whenever I'm asking the students to do this, you can literally, or I, if I ask a, a, a sort of a public audience to do it, you can literally see people across the audience going, they're trying to count up, right? How many fruits and vegetables they they eat on a regular basis. And you know, people start doing like, okay, iceberg lettuce, romaine lettuce, uh, spinach, apples, bananas. Uh, you know, it's pretty easy to get to five. It's pretty easy to get to 10 when you really think about it. But then you can see people go, oh, uh, okay, peppers, grapes, uh, oranges, strawberries, blueberries. Like, you know, you can get, once you get past 15 or 20, people get stuck. And so I, I'll challenge people, I'll say, look, Again, go to the produce section. And while you're going around getting all your different colors, go find something you've never seen before. Go and say, like, find the produce guy and say, hey, what is this? It, how do I eat this? Do I, do I peel it? Do I not peel it? Do I cook it? Do I not cook it? Do, you know, find out what it is and go Google a recipe for it. It's a really fun way to do it. And if you can get all these 30 plants in, not only are you going to get more fibers, not only are you going to get more phytonutrients, but you will specifically get the sweet spot of nourishing your microbiome. And so the, 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 30, the idea for the 30 plant challenge comes to us from a huge research study research project um, called the American Gut Project, where they were they, they, they look at microbiome samples and they correlate that to the diets that those people who gave the microbiome samples have been eating. My microbiome sample is in that data set. Um, and so what they've found is they can track people who eat two servings of fruits and vegetables every day have a microbiome that looks like this. And people who eat five servings look like this and 10 servings look like this and 20 servings and 30 servings. And what they're looking at is resilience of the microbiome, diversity of the microbiome. And it sort of it sort of plateaus out around 35. So 30 is much better than 25, but 35 is not that much better than 30. So that's why we that's why we sort of put a pin in the in the in the number 30 and encourage people to get that. If you get 30 plants in your diet on a regular basis, you're going to have a nearly bulletproof microbiome because it's going to be so diverse and so resilient. It's going to be sending the good signals, the happiness signals, the anti-inflammatory signals, the strong immune system signals, all, all the things that we want to do in a sort of a fun little way. I would encourage you guys who are watching, who are brand partners, 
to do this with your teams, right? Say, hey, we're off on a really cool challenge right now. Let's 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 do this as a team. Let's see if we can get 30 plants. And then what I do with my students is they have to document what plants they're eating over that over that one week time period. And then they have to tell us how they're feeling. And so everybody does their, you know, we're on a Zoom thing like this. And everybody has to say like, yeah, it gave me gas for a couple of days. Or I, I I, didn't like the taste of this. Or it was bitter. And this is how I solved that. And, you know, almost 100% of the time by the end of that week, the reports back are, yeah, I actually did feel better. And you know what? I'm not going to go back to the way I was eating before. I'm going to keep on with this. Maybe not 30, but I'm going to do as well as I can and try to get as much of that diversity in my diet, which means a diversity in my microbiome, which means a diversity of these signals, which means that I feel better. All right. So like we can get very kind of formulaic with it that way. All right. What if you're not eating 30 plants every day, right? What are you going to do? You're trying as hard as you can. Maybe this week was just a just a you know what storm uh, uh, of a week and you couldn't you couldn't get your 30 in that's where the supplements come in you guys that's where you can say well wait a minute i'm not getting all the fibers that i need why wouldn't i add in something like seed fiber which gives you different not just different fibers but also different phytonutrients for the reasons that i said before so here you can see these three Sunflower seed, cucumber seed, cranberry seed. Um, the the if you've never tried this product before, you should you should give it a try. This is the product I start my day with every single day. I actually put this in my happy juice. Um, you have to keep stirring it up when you put it in happy juice. So I go stir, 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 drink, and then I go back to doing what I was doing and stir, 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 drink to to because it settles out a little bit. Because what we're doing, where we're getting the seed, where we're getting the fiber and the phytonutrients is from these seed hulls. So these are cold pressed seeds where when you squish a sunflower seed to get the oil out of it. The oil goes over there. And what we keep is we keep that seed hull because that seed hull has a lot of fiber and a lot of phytonutrients. And we don't give you just sunflower seed, right? Remember what I said before about we want a diversity of fibers and a diversity of phytonutrients. We give you these three and we give you these three, black cumin seed, blackberry seed, conquer grape seed, because each one of those is a different kind of fiber, which is going to feed a different kind of microbiome bacteria and a different collection of phytonutrients, which are going to activate those CDRs across your entire cells, right? So you're feeding your bacterial cells and you're feeding your, your body cells, your somatic cells at the same time. We actually just did a, a clinical trial on this black cumin seed oil to show that it can help the microbiome and can help your immune system. And so um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about those data later on, but you know, we continue to look at this from a scientific perspective. So we can say, look, if you add this nutrient or you include this nutrient in your diet, what's the end benefit? You know, do you see people get fewer colds and flus? Do you see people have less, um, less anxiety or less brain fog or something like that? Because that's what really matters. Um, it, are, are people feeling better? Are people performing better? Are they out there in the world doing better? You can do something like this. You can do superfood where this is, again, looking at a diversity of those different fruit and vegetable extracts. The, the, the antioxidant power of this is about three servings of fruits and vegetables, right? That's always sort of a moving target. We probably could push this and say, ah, it's more like five or it's more like six. We want to be a little conservative with our recommendations. So this is something I start my day off with every single day. People, people think it's funny that my happy juice is a little bit different than the average happy juice. So I use regular happy juice, but I take away the energy piece of it because I use energy in my in my water bottles later on in the day when I do my running and biking and gym workouts and things like that. My happy juice in the morning is mentabiotics, edge, superfood, and seed fiber. It's it's those because I really, really, for all the reasons that I've been talking about right now, I really want to make sure that I'm getting my phytonutrients. I really want to make sure that I'm getting a diversity of fiber. I really want to make sure that I'm getting things like these prebiotics that are the base of superfood that really hold those fruit and vegetable extracts, apple fiber and chia seed and flax seed that are giving you different kinds of fiber, um, uh, you know, in addition to what we're what we're doing with with, with seed fiber. I want to make sure I'm getting phytonutrients like this, which is in this, which is in the seed fiber. Um, this is a very, very unique enzyme treated Japanese asparagus extract that that increases something called heat shock proteins. So when heat shock proteins go up, 
that is the signal to the cell to start the process called autophagy, which is cellular cleanup and repair and rebuilding. So if you're getting damaged every single day by stress, you want to make sure that you're activating that intracellular process to repair and recuperate and come back even stronger so you can you can withstand the stress the next day. That's exactly what this asparagus extract does. So, you know, we want we I I want that every day. We also can look at things like if we're, if we're thinking sort of 30 plant challenge again, we want to make sure that we're getting a diversity in our in our diets, but also a diversity in our supplements. So you can count these, you guys, right? In your 30 that you're using for your challenge, you can count the saffron that you're getting. Remember, spices are a really important part of the mental fitness pyramid, right? We want to get as many of those as possible. So the saffron that you see in kids mood, count it. The 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 holy basil and the and the oregano and the and the clove and all that in, that are in there, count it. The the turmeric and the boswellia that are in that are in relief, count it. The chickpea fiber, the oligosaccharides that are in the protein, the GBX protein that is based on chickpea fiber, ch chickpea protein, which also comes along with the fiber, count it, right? So that is going to help you close that 30 plants challenge because we can count the spices, we can count the fibers, we can count all of that. So, you know, when you look at what we've done with our, with our, with our foods and our supplements at Amari, we've had this in the, in the, in the forefront since since day one. And now the research is actually catching up and proving what we've been doing all, all along, right? And it really just sort of, you know, puts an exclamation point on the whole mental wellness mission that we've that we've got going on. So if anybody wants to dig in more, we're just getting to the top of the hour. So I want to wrap it up and see if I can answer a couple of couple of questions. I see somebody put in something like, I love this in my overnight oats. Yeah. Like that's a great way to you do overnight oats and you throw in some you know, you throw in some um, some nuts. You know, when you're when you're ready for that, you throw in a handful of fresh berries. Once you once you mix it all up, you're like you're 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 able to you know make it make a couple of different counts there right there. If you guys are interested in digging more into uh, into these concepts, there's a few books I can recommend. My book, of course, Mental Fitness, um, or the course that we do around it to train people as certified mental wellness coaches. We're actually doing one next month in uh, in Phoenix. So check my blog for the for the details. Um, these two are really good. These are two of my colleagues. This one's written by a professor um, in Australia, Felice Jacka. Um, her book, Brain Changer, really, really gets into the nitty gritty of the science around the Mediterranean diet and the Scandinavian diet and the Okinawan diet and how they can not just be therapeutic and preventative for depression, but also for Alzheimer's and dementia and those and those sorts of things. Very scientific book. It's it, it's it's written not just for scientists, it's written for a non-scientific audience, but it's a there's a lot of details there, right? So if you're into that, go and go and give give that a look. This one written by Uma Nadu. She's an MD. She's a psychiatrist, but she's also a trained chef, which I think is really, really cool. She lives not too far from where I do here. She's uh, she's on the faculty at, at Harvard Medical School, um, and Uma uh, doesn't just tell you what foods to eat, right? She doesn't just say saffron's great or uh, turmeric is great because she's a chef. She she educates you about how to use it, right? How to how to how to put it in a recipe, how to how to include it into a meal that you can actually ingest and uh, and you know get some get some enjoyment as well as some health benefits. So check out both those books, um, see what you think of them. Don't forget about the specials that are going on, right? You can you can get this new product that we're launching in just a couple of weeks as a free gift if you if you go through this this promotion. Um, and of course, Happy Juice and Triangle of Health are on sale uh, throughout the entire month of January. So I'm going to close with this, you guys. Every single time we eat, whether it's a meal or a snack or a supplement, we get to choose how we feel, right? We can choose... To not feel good later, we can choose to feel better and better and better. And anyone who's ever like this time of year, a lot of people are, are saying to themselves, I, I'm going to eat better this year. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do it. Finally, this year, I'm going to do it. If we can do it in little baby steps like that, we can do a fun challenge like 30 plants. We can do something where we say, hey, this week, we're going to add a fermented food. And next week, we're going to add uh, a high fiber food. And next week, we're going to add a different colored food, right? We can we can be fun like that. We can add we can add different supplements to help us, you know, help us close that gap. The more we can do that, the more we can get help people feel better 
and then more better and then more better. And then pretty soon they come back and they go, oh my gosh, I don't ever want to go back to there where I had brain fog and I had the blues and I felt bloated all the time and I had no energy and, 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 right. They'll be on this side, right. They'll be, they'll be where most of us are now and just, just singing the praises about mental well being. Okay. So let me do this. I'm going to stop the share. I'm going to go up here and see if there's some questions in here. Oh, where did that go? All right. Um, there's attendees. Let me go back down here real quick, you guys, and see if there's a if there's a QA panel. Um, sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. Okay, I'll just look in the I'll just look in the chat. I'm gonna I'm gonna page through the chat a little bit and see if there's a couple of questions. We've got four minutes left till the top of the hour, um, and see if there's some questions in here that I can answer. I'm not able to jump over to Facebook right now, the way my, the way my screens are set up. But like I said, if you have questions on and you're, and you're tuning in on Facebook, um, certainly put your questions into the comments area and someone will get in there, whether, whether it's me or somebody from the team, will get in there and uh, answer the, answer the information. Um, so I'm not seeing, I'm not, so here, somebody, somebody's talking about sunrise, right? So sunrise takes this approach, right? Sunrise takes this approach of having all these different superfoods in there, right? Whether it's blueberry juice or it's or it's wolfberry or it's, you know, whatever it is, right? And so this is something that I'm really looking forward to talking about more about how we can use this kind of thing to, to can, can continue closing the gap, right? Obviously I'm more versed in um in in the way that we're doing the way that we've been doing it at Amari with the seed fiber and the superfood and you know the, the, those sorts of things. But wherever you can find that to close that gap, that's always going to be a good thing. Um, let me see if there's some questions in here that might make sense for me to answer. Just a lot of a lot of really a really good really good comments. Um, All right, let me see if this is one. I heard something the other day about whether you came from an ingredient home or a prepared food home. So if you can't find anything to eat in your fridge and pantry are full of ingredients, maybe you came from a prepared food home. It was interesting. That's a Hillary, that's a really really good way to do it. Um so part of what I did with this with this chef's organization is, you know, help the kids l learn how to learn how to cook. Um so one of the cool things about it that we found, we didn't know this going into it, but now it's sort of sort of common knowledge is that we also, at a lot of those schools, we help the schools start um, little community gardens. And so what we found was if you just gave the healthy food to the kids, and there were some school districts that tried that around the country, they said, we're going to take out all the junk food from the school from the school lunch program. We're going to put in healthy foods, and we're going to give it to the kids. What do you think the kids did? They all went, oh, gross. I'm not going to eat that. But then it, it was healthy food. It tasted good, but they, they, it was new and they didn't want to do anything with it. When you got the kids to grow it and see it and interact with it and harvest it, they picked it. And then the chefs came in and they showed them how to prepare it, like what to do with that eggplant, what to do with those cucumbers and the, the, those, those leeks and like, what the heck is that? Once the kids actually experienced growing it and experienced preparing it, they were all over it, right? It was gone. Like kids gobbled it down because they were invested in it. And so we like we we found that over the years that we were doing this program. And it was really cool because it was that program and the documentary that I did that got us invited to go um, to the White House to see how at that time it was the Obamas that were in that were in uh in in office. And one of Michelle's Michelle Obama's platforms was childhood obesity. So they made a garden on the on the lawn of the White House and their kids got to learn how to grow the food and go into the into the kitchen with the with the White House chef and prepare the food and it became a whole a whole big thing, right? So it doesn't matter who's in the White House, <laughs> this is always going to be a good thing for us to be able to teach our kids how to how to have those skills because if they develop them when their skills, they'll have them as 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 adults and they won't have to look in the fridge and go, what am I going to do with these ingredients? Uh, because they're going to look in there and go, oh, you know what I could do with these ingredients? And they're going to get very creative and they're going to they're going to have that as a skill set. So anyway, that was a little bit off the track of what we what we sometimes talk about when we talk just about supplements. But I think it's important for people to realize at this time of year, 
sure, the supplements can be a really, really important piece of those overall programs. But if we can, and if we can make those supplements science-based and experiential where people feel them and they plug them in and their energy is better and their mood is better and their stress eating is lower and their appetite is controlled and they're not having those cravings, all that is going to be good stuff. And that's going to help them stay on that plan of eating the right way and moving their bodies and getting their sleep and doing the lifestyle program. The supplements can facilitate them doing that healthy lifestyle program. And they're going to see the benefits and they're going to come back and they're going to thank all of us. Okay. So take that off into the new year. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing everybody that we're going to see at the, at the leadership event, the leadership summit in new Orleans, uh, the beginning of next month. Um, so if, uh, if I haven't met you before, uh, please come up and introduce yourself when you see me in, uh, in NOLA. Okay. See you guys next time. Bye-bye.